Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming in such a great number. And as you may know, tonight we talk about Zen and Karma. And to do that, I need you to use your imagination. Imagine an onion. Everybody grows onions here, right? And onions have layers. Outside is the peel, this kind of earthy, dusty, not so useful part. Then there is the first layer, the next layer, and depending on the size and age of the onion, there are layers. In the very center, there is this yellowish stalk, which is connected to the root. So let's put the onion to the shelf, and now we talk about human beings. When we are born, we are these wonderful little babies, and totally lovable toddlers, and later on, adolescents, etc. And when we become teenagers, we change quite significantly. And by the end of our teenagers and early 20s, we start to feel really adults, maybe even sooner. And by the mid-20s, we have an adult personality with almost no trace of this lovable baby that we were about 20 years before. And soon we have our marriages, our houses, our jobs, our mortgages, our problems, our dreams, our failures, frustrations, but we have them all. And at some point, when all this starts to hit us in the face, when it becomes too much or unmanageable, we stop and look. Where did all this come from? What am I really as a human being? And then we start to see the onion. When you look at yourself really, really deep, that's when you first start to touch the peel, the outside crust. It's the first layer of your individuality, the toughest part of your ego, all your defenses, all your I, my, me, the first touch, that's the outer crust. Then you go one layer deeper and then you see your family karma as the first real tasty part. Next layer is your ancestry. You see your ancestry line descending into you. That's the next layer. Then you see your neighborhood, where you were born. Then your nationality. Then your whole country. Then your continent. Then your civilization. Then your general species as human, human being. And the deeper you go, the less easy it is to determine it. We have a very, very specific definition of who we are. But even as your family, you see your family different from your father's viewpoint, mother's viewpoint, sibling's viewpoint. And when you go to your nationality or culture or civilization, then the definitions become numberless. The most interesting part is when you reach this yellowish stalk right in the very center stemming from the root. What is our common root as human beings? What are we? That's when Zen begins. That's when you direct your question inside. That's when you change your direction and you do not deal with the layers of identity, but you change and ask about the root, where we all come from. It's a very different sense of identity. Because if we do not find our roots, we also do not find where we grow. This is why it's so crucially important to have a deeper sense of identity than just individuality, family, nation, culture, civilization, or species. We should and we can go even deeper than that. So I'll give you a story about that. And he is the father of modern Zen as we know it. He lived in an era called the Tang Dynasty. It was the golden age of Chinese Buddhism, ending about 860 AD, and it lasted about 300 years. That's the golden age of Chinese Buddhism. Virtually any book you read about classical Zen is from that era. And there was a very famous Zen master called Chao Chou in Chinese or Joju in Korean. There was an attendant in his room helping with daily duties. And there was a visitor coming in asking for the Zen master's teaching. So the visitor pays his respects and Joju asks, Where do you come from? I come from the south, master. Really? From the south? Yes, sir. Then go drink tea. The visitor was very surprised and deeply bowed. Zen master, great teaching, went to drink tea. Next visitor comes. Zen master asks, Where do you come from? From the north, sir. Really? From the north? Yes, sir. 
go drink tea. The visitor leaves and then the, the attendant has a little bit of a doubt in his mind. He says, Master, can I have a question? And the good part of being an attendant is that if you find the right moment, you can get exquisitely good teaching from the Zen master because you serve him all day. So Joju says, no problem, okay, ask anything. Sir, one visitor said he was from the south and you, and you told him go drink tea. The other said he was from the north and you told him go drink tea. Why? Attendant, go drink tea. That's a little taste of Zen. So that's how you get to the root of it. And that root is manifest in this moment. And there are many names for it. But this essence originally has no name, no form. So if you think to attain it, you cannot. From the stories, you can get a little taste. But if you watch and listen carefully, when you hear this sound, you have no thinking. That moment is without I, my, me. That's when all the layers of the onion whoosh, fall off. And then you perceive your own root as a human being. And of course, our sense of identity is very strong, so the next moment after the hit, the onion reassembles itself. So why is it important to experience our true nature? After all, we have to function in everyday life, we have to speak, we have to think, we have to act, we have to do everything, whether we are monks, nuns, lay people, doesn't matter, we have to act as an individual, etc., etc. Because the moment you see your true nature, all your ideas and illusions about yourself disappear. Also, all your problems, personality disorders, and sicknesses coming out of these delusions disappear. Most of the psychosomatic illnesses can be traced back to the wrong idea of self. Your relationship problems in the world are directly traceable to your wrong idea of self, family, and group. So, it seems that current society deals with the material part of everything first. Then maybe, maybe with the psychological aspect and a little bit with the spiritual or not at all. Traditionally, Zen was going the other way, approaching the onion from the root and not from the outer crust. Whatever you think you are, whatever you were made to believe that you are, whatever you were conditioned to believe that you are, is not important compared to the true experience of what you truly are. What should you do to attain this? You may expect some special meditation technique here. Alas, no. Technique is like a glass, but what we need is the water. So if I teach you the technique, you will try to drink the glass instead of the water. We confuse technique with content or phenomena with the essence. So the most important meditation technique is to be honest with yourself. Without that, how would you ever attain your true nature which is clear like space, clear like a mirror? If you have your layers of self-defense, you will never get to your true nature. So, next step, stop your judgments. If you don't stop your judgments, you will always see things and people as plus or minus, zero or one, good and bad, etc., etc., etc. And judgments are not static, they are dynamic. They create waves, they create reality. They, in fact, distort reality, not only create that. So what's the user's manual with your dualistic thinking? Distinguish, but do not discriminate. So I ask you, this stick and this table, are they the same or are they different? If you're a good Zen student and you had a few interviews, you know that the stick is the stick, the table is the table. But many times we believe that the stick is better and the table is worse then instead of distinguishing, we discriminate. So, distinctions are based on observation, discrimination is based on projection. And when we talk about objects, it's very easy to see that, but when we talk about relationships, it becomes extremely difficult. That's why we need to practice clarity. Out of clarity comes the experience of non-duality, when you and this world become one. That's when your mind becomes clear like space, clear like a mirror. And that's when you can see clearly, hear clearly, 
taste, smell, touch, think, feel clearly. And this clarity doesn't mean that you always observe everything like in a mirror. This is the state of oneness. But yet, it is a state of complete perception. So if you say this is one, it's a mistake. If you say this is two, it's also a mistake. That's why we say, don't know. There's one thing we observe. If you start thinking, that thinking acts like a wall, like another layer and another layer of the onion between you and the world. That's why if you have enough experience with family problems, listening, observation, and perception are way more useful than arguments. That enables you to really see what's in the other person. What kind of thinking? What kind of emotion? What kind of willpower? In all, we call this the presence of the other human being. If your mind is not clear, if you mix that with your own thinking, with your own emotions, you cannot perceive clearly. What is the relationship between the disturbance in your mind and your sense of identity? Habits. So your habitual thinking, your habitual pattern of emotions, they correspond with your sense of identity. So if there's any hindrance, any layer of filters or judgments in your mind, that comes from your sense of identity. That's the way I think. That's the way I feel. That's the way I am. And obviously, we want to clear these hindrances to be absolutely, spotlessly clear. And most of the time, we don't think that it has a relationship to who we think we are. So spare your thoughts, spare your emotions, but please get rid of your sense of ego. You can do that. If you can do that, you do a great service to yourself and all other humans and other sentient beings. So remember the onion. If you identify with any of the layers as your absolute identity, you make a mistake. These layers are there. They are conditioned reality. They are relative. And we should treat them as such. In our relationships, we can and we should treat them with acceptance and respect. But that's not who we truly are. In order to get to that, discard the layers, get to the root. It is not difficult to understand it. But to do it and to walk on that path, that's a very different ballgame. Because you have to face yourself. You have to see yourself. You have to see the unexplored, the shady parts of your personality. Because your conscious sense of self is about 5% of your whole personality. And unless we do some mental practice, some meditation, we do not explore deeper. Estimated 90 to 95 percent of ourself is un or subconscious. And as a side effect of meditation practice, you discover certain aspects of that. <coughs> certain archetypes will appear. Certain past karma appears. And most of it you don't like. Most of it you cannot accept at first. Me? That's not me. That's not possible. Keep asking your question. What is this? Another layer, what is this? Another layer, what is this? And with the question, you detach your identity from that. Then you can transcend it. So remember the two most important meditation techniques. Be honest and don't be judgmental. That's what enables you to go beyond any sense of self. Your mind moves, your judgments kick in, and you get stuck in that layer. Then it starts to vibrate with good and bad. And then you are environment starts to react. That's why in the old Chinese wisdom we said not moving body, not moving speech, not moving mind. Not moving body, that means you sit still in meditation. Not moving speech means you are quiet and you don't talk. And not moving mind means you do not have any conscious or intentional thought in your mind. That's how you can perceive. That's how your mind becomes clear like a mirror, a very precisely polished mirror. And that takes time. When you use your bathroom mirror that's done in a few minutes in a factory, the job of that mirror is to reflect from less than a meter. And that's how this accuracy is done. But the mirrors of the James Webb Space Telescope is being created for years. 
because the purpose is to see billions of light years and that's why the accuracy is very different so if you want to see really deep inside you should have a very clear and precise mirror inside and that's why it takes time and the road to that is not always pleasant so please do not look for instant happiness it's not given to you by any true path but also there is no special difficulty there is no blood sweat and tears there is nothing that should make you feel miserable so prepare yourself to see your karma as it is and in the buddha's teaching there is this word suchness or thusness for this quality as it is or you can say it's just like this in sanskrit tathata it's just like this not good not bad not high not low just like this we could go on but it would become very boring i know that and i think you heard enough and now i would like to hear your questions what is karma cause and effect action and result the accumulation of cause and effect habits based on the accumulation of cause and effect the personality based on these habits and your sense of identity based on your personality all your sensory perceptions are karma all your mental processes are karma because they are impermanent they are interdependent and they are imperfect so when you look at that then you see the whole world as a flux of sensory perceptions whether starting inside or outside so what is the source of our karma the avatamsaka sutra says if you want to truly perceive the nature of this universe then see it as created by mind alone so the question yes yeah, sure but what is this mind is this the 5% we know as self is that the missing 95 is that all human minds combined yeah. all human and animal minds combined so all the minds existing on this planet and maybe somewhere else combined so do we know that we don't so if you attain this don't know you attain this great mind and if you attain this great mind you attain the source of all your karma we call that our true nature but originally it has no name no form so you can experience it but you cannot get there just by your thinking or your feelings you attain this you attain the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end and then you have control before that you think you have control but you don't how can that be proven when just one part of your karma the strength of your personality controls the rest in crisis it fails if it's your true nature it doesn't fail what's the biggest crisis in our lives death you are afraid of death that means you are still attached to some karma you're not afraid of death this means your ego is gone your sense of i my me is gone your true nature is shining bright and that's why another sutra the heart sutra says without any hindrance no fears exist i would like to ask you um, relating to meditation i think it's um, analytical meditation if i'm not wrong uh, but i think it's would it be better to meditate uh, contemplating if i made the wrong impression i have to correct myself this is not analytic meditation we do ask the question what is this but we don't analyze very important if you don't ask the question you don't burn through the layers but if you analyze you get stuck in the layers so you ask the question and you let your mind expand so when i say clear like space that's not just a figure of speech that's an actual experience when you meditate so our late great teacher sung san sunim he said like infinite space but precise like a laser beam so the infinitely great and infinitesimally small are absolutely together so that is called true contemplation no analysis you said previously that you need to not be afraid anymore of karma in order to of death in order to free yourself uh, of karma uh, 
I am afraid of death, but not because I'm too self-involved or anything, but because I love very much my life and the people around me and the people in my life. So why wouldn't I be afraid of death? When you ask, when you ask a question like this, we say, you're scratching your left foot when the right one itches. Look at this. You are afraid of loss. And you identify loss with death. No, I'm afraid of the pain I, I might cause by disappearing to the yes. person that I love. You just talked about losing your friends and losing people you love. But that happens while you are alive, too. And if you talk about losing loved ones, well, they also lose you. You lose them from this world. But don't worry. Who knows? Somebody may be waiting for you on the other side. So you presume you lose them. Because you don't have a body anymore. But you actually don't know what happens to your soul when you depart from this world. So do not identify loss with death, number one. And do not think that there is some kind of idea of loneliness or isolation or nothingness after you leave this body. Have you ever lost your body into not it? Not that I know of. <laughs> Great. So you actually don't know what that is like. Keep that mind. Keep that don't know. That is your helper and savior. You identify with your projections. You fall into your own hell. That is worse than leaving your body. Okay? Good. More questions? I want to ask, how is karma related to our past lives? Very good question. Lives? Uh, I have good news and bad news. Which one would you like? Oh. Good. <laughs> so... All your past lives are karma. All your present is karma. All your future lives will be karma. This is the best, the good news. You decide. <laughs> <laughs> but wherever we are and whoever we are, we can experience the source of past, present, and future karma, all of them. So like I said earlier, karma is cause and effect. Life means you take a body. Living means you have a body. Dying means you lose the body. And then you are without a body. We call that non-incarnated state. So this is like a cycle. You look at nature, the four seasons give you that. And I don't even have to identify which one's which. You already know that. I just give you a hint. Spring is being born. But where does all this come from? What is it that revolves all this around? What is the substance that our soul is made of? Now, if you want to find that... You have to stop the mind and conquer the habit of this migration. And there is no bad news. If you do it, if you follow the path, you wake up and you attain. You don't, then you just progress with the speed of sensory perceptions and material cause and effect slowly, slowly, slowly. But if you meditate, you can process all your past karma. And that changes your present and your future. If you don't, you only follow your karma, you have not much of a choice. But if you practice, your mind becomes clear, wonderful, you have more choice. I cannot give you any better news than that. I would like to ask, uh, why bad things happen to good people? Is it related to karma? I am asking you, why do you see those people and that karma as good and bad? Does that help you? Does that help those people? Probably it's a habit that you haven't seen and haven't changed yet. I give you a metaphor. You know boomerangs, right? Very interesting object. You throw them, and if you do this right, they come back to you. If you throw them in a very big trajectory, sometimes it's even one minute, and then comes back to you. And if you're a pro, you know it. You threw it, you wait, and it comes back to you. You can see it all the way through. But now imagine a super boomerang. It's so big that it goes around the forest. And when it's behind the trees, you cannot see it. But when it reappears, you know that was you, and you catch the boomerang. But if that boomerang goes around the whole city, it takes much longer. And if it goes around the whole globe, you may even forget that you threw it, and yet it comes back to you. And if you don't pay attention, then it hits you, and you see, 
Where did that come from? I didn't do anything. I'm a good person. But something just hit me. How did that happen? So we are throwing boomerangs all the time at the speed of light and comes back to us very, very unpredictably. And we do that to ourselves, to each other. It's very complex. So the biggest question is not why. The biggest question is how. So how do you keep yourself aware and awake and you see karma coming back to you? How do you do that? If your mind is clear, you can perceive it way ahead. If your mind is not clear and too busy, it already hits you and even then you don't see it. You just feel some weird pain. And you look at it, wow, that's a bullet. And then you remember, oh, two years ago I shot a gun. And now the bullet reached me. So let's be careful with that. More questions? Could other people's boomerangs hit us back? Yes, if you receive it. If you have an I, my, me, then you can be hit. If your mind is like space, the boomerang travels through. Your reactions change the trajectory. No reaction, no change. No I, my, me, no hit. Just like Buddha Shakyamuni said in the Dhammapada, if you do not receive somebody's anger, it will certainly return to the sender where it came from. So be careful with your judgments and your dualistic reactions. That changes the trajectory of other people's impulses and intentions to you. If your mind is clear like space, you cannot be hit. Remember that. All that karma returns to the sender. Very good. One question here. Is there any way to tame karma? Let's say that if I realize that I did something wrong and want to make it up for it in order to avoid karma reaching me, is there any way I could do that? Yes. Tell me about it. <laughs> First, you have to see the nature of this karma. When we say it's impermanent and interdependent, it reveals something. It means that it doesn't exist by itself. It constantly needs energy from you and mostly you give that to your karma, to your habits, subconsciously. So you take that energy out, it's like totally venting the fuel from your car and it will not be able to move. So everybody wants to run against their own habits and their personalities. It's like trying to stop a car which is running at 150 kilometers per hour on the highway. You get squashed. You die. And in the last moment, you see, oh, I'm driving. Bam! You did the wrong thing. You try to stop and control something which was running at 150k per hour. That is, you went against your own willpower. You went against your own habit force. That's a mistake. So take the fuel away from the car. And soon it starts slowing down. Then it stops by itself. In our being, as a sentient being, as a psychophysical organism, we have various energy centers with various functions. All these represent a certain kind of differentiation. That's where we have thoughts and the distinction between thoughts. That's where we have emotions and the distinction between emotions. That's where we have speech and the distinction between parts of speech. And if we go even lower, we have physical distinctions between cells of reproduction. Now we have a spot, in fact, that's our gravity center. It's called the navel chakra, in Sanskrit, the muladhara chakra, in Chinese, tantian. That's when your energy and your mind are not separate, not differentiated into several functions. So it's your navel. It's about two finger widths below your belly button. And when you focus on that, then you experience a mind which doesn't make anything which doesn't have karma, because it has no emotions, no speech, no thinking. Now that sounds scary. How can I have something which is not me? Well, get used to it. We call that Buddha nature. That's not a self or a part of your ego. It has nothing to do with that. So that is not a car. It doesn't run 150k per hour. It doesn't have eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind. None of that. That's the point where all this energy comes from. That's your petrol station. So if you say it's something, it's a mistake. If you say it's nothing, that's also a mistake. 
it's simply undifferentiated energy and consciousness where your mind is no mind. So if you're a smart attendant in the petrol station and your car with your karma comes in, you say, I'm sorry, we ran out of fuel. Psychologically, it means your reactionary mind stops, no more reactions. It doesn't mean you turn into stone or a piece of wood or you lose anything. You just lose your attachment to karma and that's wonderful. So that's why in meditation, it's not just in Zen, in many other traditions, you see this mudra, this Mahamudra, just in line of the navel and the lower area. We don't just copy a Buddha statue, no. Oh, he did that 2,500 years ago, I do the same. No, not like that. It has very clear function to the present day, which I have just explained. Then you return to the mind which doesn't move and doesn't create anything. Then you are free. More questions? So, if I listen to a song, and I like it, the song is not good or bad, my reaction to the song is um, my karma. Really? <laughs> Why do you do that to the song? <laughs> Wait, I'm not finished. <laughs> I'm so helping her. My reaction... <laughs> <laughs> You're nasty, go ahead. <laughs> okay. My reaction to the song is my karma, because the song is not inherently good or bad. Uh -huh. My question is, what if many people like this song and few people dislike this song? And this is like collective karma or just individual collective karma? <laughs> I think the strongest effect this has is related to the sales figures of the CD. <laughs> so if you feel you are connected to a piece of music, listen to that. It's like your heart singing. You cannot connect to it, you can discard it. It's not so important. It's very natural that you hear something or someone, you immediately feel some connection. And it's so instinctive that you do not even have to judge, you just feel connection or not and it doesn't make a song good or bad or you good or bad if you don't think about it so just you feel oh that's like my heart singing or my complete being just moving or becoming one with that which the music represents it's really hard to put into words especially in case of music because it's so immaterial and wonderful so use your deepest intuition and then you will always know what to choose. But I still have a question about the collective karma, how, how it's working actually. It's working in a way that um, artists and managers and producers, they try to assess what people like. And uh, when they know what people like, they produce things that is commonly desired. And that makes a lot more money in that way. So uh, that's why we are supremely easy to judge by our likes and dislikes. And when uh, really perceptive people use that in business, they know exactly what you desire. And then they harness that. And we call that just business. It's just business. But there is something deeper than that. Sometimes you hear artists and see artists that they just give their hearts to the world. That they do something they believe in, which is not marketing or an image or a very calculated production to satisfy massive demand. You can always see that. And that's what I call original. I don't care how many people like it. I believe in it. I put that heart to the world in an artistic form. And you can always see that. And that's what I can personally connect to. And when you feel some kind of connection, this heart-to-heart -heart connection, that wherever the artist is, whoever the artist is, our hearts are connected through the artwork, that's genuine. Yeah, so you talked uh, before the, the music question about the, um, the navel chakra. Yes. Um, would you say that meditation on, on concentrating upon the navel chakra is the most important or... I don't know. The most the... important physical part yeah. of it. Okay. Meditation from a technical 
point of view has three parts, physical, energetic, and mental. Physically, I tell you how to sit, where to focus, you know, your center of attention in the body, and uh, what to do with the details. And then, if you do that right, it helps your energy focus to the same place. In the case of Zen, your energy focus, your mind's focus, and your physical focus is exactly in the same place. Energy in this case is breathing. And breathing connects body and mind. So you connect breathing to your tanjon exactly where your body's gravity center is and exactly where your mind is not yet differentiated into feelings, speech, thoughts, and sensory perceptions. So it's very simple. All one point. So it's like the three locks of a safe. If you set the three dials right, you open the safe. But this is a Zen safe. You don't find anything in it. But when the safe opens, the safe box disappears. Then the inside and the outside completely become one. Because the essence of this world and the essence of yourself is the same substance. So when inside and outside become one and this metal box of yourself disappears, we call that great happiness or the joy of Dharma. And I have to be more precise. The first reaction to that experience is great happiness. It's not the experience itself. And for that you have to work hard. It doesn't come easy, it doesn't come free. You have to pay with your own ideas. You have to give up your illusions. That's the price. Next question. Thank you. You're welcome. If you say that uh, everything is not good, not bad, um, what's your impression about our emotions? How do we um, manage them and how we should um, connect them? Emotions are powerful. That's number one. Way more powerful than our thoughts. And what is important is to see where that energy goes. So when you mix thoughts and emotions, it can become very dangerous. If you want to see clearly, see emotions as emotions. See thoughts as thoughts. Not easy. When you see your emotions clearly, you, <coughs> you also see the cause and effect relationship between them. It's like having many, many trays and you pour water on top of one and it goes into the other, the other, the other, the other. Then you see how your happiness becomes possession, your possession becomes jealousy, your jealousy poisons a relationship and it's all emotional, one by one. So what kind of direction do you give to your emotional energy? That's very important. Most people want happiness very much and it's very natural, but when they get it, they absolutely don't know what to do with it. And the worst thing we can do with happiness is to want to keep it for ourselves. And the funny thing is, if you want to keep happiness, you must share it. The more you share your happiness, the more it comes back to you from other beings. And if we understand that with that dog, why don't we understand that with our fellow humans? And the answer is because a human being is way more complex than a dog. And no disrespect to any dog. I like them. Perceive emotions. See where you direct them, where they come from and where they go. So when you meditate, you ask this question, not just what is this, but where does it come from? Then you can see deeper, more layers of the onion, and sometimes it smells. It's this sharp, strong smell. And then you cry. And you cry a lot before you find the window that you open to air it out. So, I want to ask about the people in our life. Uh, we know that everything happens for a reason and we don't meet people by accident. Is that related with the karma effect? Yes. It's uh, very interesting how we meet and how we form relationships. Especially when it becomes like a marital relationship. How could I marry this person? Oh my God. <laughs> or how could I not? <laughs> Every heart has its beep, 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 and then other heart says beep, 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 and chuk, the frequencies connect. And you lived long enough to see that if you have the same vibes, you get the same guys. 
<laughs> if you want to change the guys, change the vibes. <laughs> So that's why when we talk about tanjan, that means everything returns before emotions, before the beep, beep starts. And when you have that, you can start a new frequency. You can develop a new personality. You can change your habits, and that changes your attraction patterns. When you have this clarity and that's kind of uh, clear like space, clear like mirror consciousness, you can see steps of cause and effect ahead. Most people believe that past, present, and future are separate, and they are on a line. And we have this present moment as part of that line. But that is a limited view. Time is not linear. It's not even cyclical. But our thinking can be linear or cyclical. And those who recognize this, they put that wisdom into the Diamond Sutra. And they said, the mind, which is divided into past, present, and future, cannot get enlightenment. Because... At this moment, there is the past, the present, and the future. It's a delusion that they are separate. So, when you see that you have attracted somebody, you don't just see the first layer. You see the next, the third, the fourth, etc., etc. That's why beauty is a tricky thing. When we fall in love with beauty, or the person representing that beauty, we many times believe that that's everything there is. It fills us totally. And we forget that beauty is just the packaging. And inside there is the Pandora's box of your karma. But it's very nicely packaged. And then one year passes, three years pass of a relationship, then you see the deeper content. This does not mean that there's something wrong with the world or you or us as human beings. That's just the way things work. So don't stand before the 150 kilometer fast car of your attraction. Don't try to stop that. Just yeah. direct it to the right person. If you do this in the right way, it can be a very nice formation cruise on the highway for one lifetime or more. If you do this in the wrong way, it's an accident. And with this kind of clarity, you can see what's inside the box even before you open the packaging. Very important. And that helps you and the other person as well. We call that wisdom and compassion combined. More questions? The statistics is getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> what is if there is identity? Who do you think you are? Don't know. Then there is no identity for you. Who am I for you? I believe you're a teacher. Wrong. We call that head of a dragon, tail of a snake. Can I take it in a, in a wood? In a good way, even if it's a dragon with a tail and the head. <laughs> now you are painting legs on the okay. snake. <laughs> you ask me the same question as I asked you. What was my first question to you? Ah, who do you think you are? So same point. You don't have a stick. I do. So you did the right thing is the right answer. What was my next question to you? What do you think I am yes, to you? Ask me that. What do you think I am to you? Okay. No, I see. No, I see. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> no eyes, no, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. How can you see? I gave you a very high ball. You can hit it. I realize I... I I cannot name it. I, I can't okay. name it. <laughs> Come tomorrow for meditation. That will help you. Okay. Because this is, this is the part when lecture can turn into Zen. We have explained a lot. But what you asked made demonstration. And that demonstration is the beginning. So very good question. Very good question. More questions? Don't analyze. I see your mind is so much working on this. Why did he hit first? Why did he hit second? What does this really mean? Why not accept his reply? If you think, you never get it. If you don't think, in an instant, it's yours. Okay? Last few questions and then we are off home. Yeah, go ahead. Like how long could we go on into this no thinking mode? How long do you want? When you attain this no thinking, there is no time. 
Your thinking makes time. So that's why in meditation we have somebody indicating the length because you actually lose track of time, which is very healthy. You don't have to have this clockwork inside. I it's do. your left brain thinking which makes this, okay? Okay? It didn't help you. I know that. <laughs> but you will process this, okay? And that will help you. So um, you said that when you meditate, you lose time because you don't you can it. yeah you can you, you, you not always do but you can you can um but um us as human beings we are um, let's say social beings yes we <laughs> unless so... you are a hermit yes. and you isolate yourself in your own bathroom <laughs> okay <laughs> yes so uh, you need the presence of others and uh in your life uh, and their attention yes yeah, so, so what's your question? Yeah, my question would be, <laughs> uh, if you lose time, uh, don't you, time and track of time, don't you lose time that you may spend with them? Losing the sense of time does not mean that you lose time itself. The time you spend with meditation is very precious. It's like recharging your battery and cleaning the windscreen of your car and all the lights, all the controls, and that's why you have to lose the sense of time. I was just completing your answer. You did that? <laughs> oh my God! How did that happen? You see? So, we are talking about two different things. One is investing in your clarity and the other is wasting your resources. So you don't lose that time which you spend in meditation. You just lose the sense of time while doing it. Then you return to daily life, then your little thing kicks back. And you know that I spent five minutes with this, one hour with this. You look at your phone, you can read it, you can use it. Very important point. Anything else? Anyone else? So you said that um, it would be a big accident to try to... Uh, Control your uh, emotions. Manually, yes. We call that repression. And when you do that, you can explode. You can develop personality disorders, all kinds of deformations. Because you took your emotions and wanted to manually control them. And mostly, that's defiance. It starts with defiance. Then it turns into frustration, then into anger, then into aggression. Look at these stupid school shootings. That's how it begins, okay? So look at these very tragic shootings in schools, movie theaters, etc. They all start with mishandling emotions. So when we see others mistreating others, then there was a period in their emotional lives when they mistreated themselves. And whether it started with their family upbringing, their conditioning, that is beside the point right now. It's not unimportant, but at this point, Time, we do not focus on that. We focus on the individual relating to his or her emotions because that's, where you're, you're, that's what your question was about. And there is a very simple equation here. You treat yourself correctly, you treat the world correctly. You treat yourself wrongly, you treat the world wrongly. Okay, so learn to relate to your emotions correctly. See where they come from. See where they go see their origin and see their demise. And then you have a control without a fist or an iron fist on them. It becomes very natural. And most importantly, see what those emotions do in your heart and in somebody else's heart. See that cause and effect clearly. And that wisdom and compassion will help you guide your emotions to the right place. Not only that, Not only. wisdom, and also strength inside. We call that selfless power. Because you have to be stronger than your own emotions and thoughts, etc. You have to be stronger than that. So wisdom, compassion, and selfless power. I have to emphasize the selfless. What is exactly this uh, last thing? Cheers, Can you detail? It's energy that does not have the notion of I and it doesn't move. So this not moving, very clear strength 
which does not have this idea of I am strong. It feels like being the sun in the solar system. The sun has over 99% of all the mass in the solar system. All the other planets, asteroids, moons, whatever, you wrap them up and it's less than 1% of all the mass in the solar system. There is no question of gravity. The sun doesn't have a doubt. Nothing. So you can do that with your original mind's energy. You can do that. All your emotions and thoughts and everything will be weaker and smaller than your own center. More directly, I will not explain. If this motivates you to practice, then your practice experience will teach you. But thinking about it more would be a mistake because it would put you to the illusory thought that you can get this by cognition and cognition is not the path. Cognition is a very small part of the path. It's there, but it's way, way, way smaller and less important than everything else. More questions? Uh, what would be the difference between individual meditation and the group meditation in terms, of, in terms of benefits? Let me rephrase the question. What's the difference between individual and group meditation in terms of risks? <laughs> <laughs> Because the benefits would be the same because everybody wants to get enlightenment and happiness and become a better person. We all know that. But the risks are absolutely different. The risk of individual meditation is that there is no feedback. There is no surface to reflect anything from you. And you can hit the wall without even knowing it. Most people who meditate, they read some book and they say, okay, I understand enough. I can sit down and do that. And they don't have a teacher. Maybe they have some friends, but those are not practitioners. And when you want to share your experiences, after a while, you realize they don't understand you. Then you remain isolated. Then your opinions can become stronger. And these opinions can ferment into something really weird. We call that the ideas about the self. So when that happens, it's very hard to fix it. We say if you want to progress on the path safely, and dynamically at the same time, you have to have what we call the three precious ones, the teacher, the teaching, and the student's community together. So when we do some sports, we all understand that. We need a coach or a trainer, we need the technique of the sport itself, and we need friends and you know, other sports people, sportsmen, sportswomen, sports people to compete with. And then we can progress. With every job and every profession, it's the same. With the Dharma, it's the same. If you want to practice the Dharma, you need a teacher, a good teaching, and a student's group. Then comes group practice. But there's a danger to that too. You believe that the group does it and you have very little part of it. If you become dependent on the group, your sense of individual responsibility disappears. You make others responsible for your own karma, within the group and ultimately you stop making effort because you become a robot and when you are singled out you cannot distinguish yourself as an individual from the group so what i observed over the last 24 years is that there must be a balance between individual responsibility and group effort together practicing together with other people following a teacher and following some teaching is essential and then you try it also on your own. And then you return to the group and the teacher for another period of practice and then you also try on your own. In everyday life, this means that if you're serious about meditation, you do it every day. And maybe once a week, you go and see the practitioner's group and the teacher. Don't attach to the group. Don't attach to your own individuality. See the use of both and use them accordingly. When we make a sword, we all understand what we need to do if we are sword makers. You put it into fire, then you hammer it, then you put it into water and back to fire and hammer it, and then into oil, etc., etc. Various environments, various kinds of training, but it's one sword and one sword maker with his friends. Most important is the direction of your practice, why you practice. And in Zen we say, wake up, and save all beings from suffering. That's our direction. 
If you keep that in a group and if you keep that individually, then you can keep a balance and there's less of a chance to go wrong. So I have a dilemma. At the beginning, you mentioned that uh, uh, we shouldn't judge good or wrong. But now at the end, it's, uh, you, you said that uh, the last thing. Do you yeah. remember what I said? Something about that we, we know I don't. we do the right thing. Yes. So uh, I, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm perceiving some kind of a snake biting its uh, tail. I am perceiving somebody who is attached to my words. <laughs> <laughs> is that a good thing or bad thing? <laughs> That's a very smart thing. <laughs> but not so wise. <laughs> So I want to thank you all for coming tonight, for sitting through this very long talk, and I hope we all cast off our attachments and bondages, but keep our true loyalty and our meaningful relationships. You already know by now that Zen does not depend on any technique, and it is not a religion. You do not have to believe anything but your own experience. And if you progress on this path, we can all wake up. We can cast off all the layers of the onion, get to its root, and become who we truly are. And if we do that, we do a great service, not just to ourselves, but our families, our nation, our civilization, our whole world, and all beings in it. So I hope we can all practice together, attain this wonderful true nature of ours, and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much for your attention.